Ophion Media presents an interview with the composer, multi-instrumentalist, and educator Lucas Leggetti, recorded in March 2021 for broadcast on KXLU Los Angeles. Lucas, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Adam. It's a real pleasure. I, I want to start by asking you about your latest CD, which I think is going to be coming out about two days after, um, after this interview airs uh, on March 26th. Um, it's off a label called Colenio, and the title of the album is That Which Has Remained, That Which Will Emerge. Um, it's a live recording of a 2015 uh, performance and if I can sort of editorialize here a little bit, um, to me, it sounds very different from a lot of the other stuff in, in your at least published catalog. Um, so I wonder if, if we can start the interview with you talking just whatever impressions you want to share about, about this uh, latest album. Yeah, well, this record uh, is it's actually a studio recording of a piece that was conceived as what I would call a performed sound installation with audience participation. I did this piece uh, during my time in November 2015 as an artist in residence at the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. And uh, it was meant to be a kind of a community project. I interviewed people who were in some way connected with Jewish life or history in Warsaw. And not only did I ask them questions, uh, I also asked them to sing songs that they somehow remember and associate with Jewish life. And among the people I interviewed was uh, Henrik Preis, who at the time was the oldest living Jew in Poland. He was 98. Unfortunately, he passed away in the meantime at the age of 101. But uh, so that was kind of on one extreme of the age range. Uh, Henrik was a fantastic interview partner, incredibly energetic and informative. And then there were also people in their 20s who actually, like a lot of people in Poland, weren't quite sure whether they were of Jewish ancestry or not, but had some relationship to Jewish history, had something to say about it. And so I asked all these people to also sing songs and then uh, during the performance, a group of improvising musicians from Warsaw played to some of these recordings, which I made a score. I put together a kind of a soundscape for them to play to different musicians, heard different uh, tunes and different things at different times in their headphones. And I sort of mixed and conducted it from my instrument, the marimba lumina. And the audience was invited to also pick up extra headphones that had some of the signals that the uh, musicians were hearing and sing along with the songs. And so that created a, a piece that was uh, in a way, uh, you know, really meant for live performance, but we then saw that it's a, as a purely musical piece also viable to stand on its own. And so we went to the studio of the Polish national radio and recorded it. And that's what you hear on the CD. I'm not sure if it's that different from other pieces of mine. I mean, I think it, it includes aspects that have been around in my music for a long time. So I've worked a lot with headphone driven performance uh, where musicians play to something they hear through the headphones that the audience isn't hearing. That could be like metronomes, like click tracks in different tempos, but it could also be rhythmic or harmonic information and I could ask the musicians to try to duplicate what they're hearing or to try to improvise off of that somehow, off of the signal in, in some way. And all of these scenarios happen in this piece. And so uh, you're right that not a lot of my headphone driven work has been issued on CD. Um, then, of course, maybe this has more to do with found sounds and soundscapes, but my group Burkina Electric, which is a West African um, electronic pop group based in the West African country of Burkina Faso, uh, we work a lot with field recordings as well. Um, I guess maybe I've done on CD a lot of things with improvised music and then a lot of things that could maybe be labeled in some way as experimental world music but maybe not a community project like this. And this was also the first time that I was able to creatively engage 
with my own Jewish heritage. I don't have any Polish background, but uh, definitely Jewish. Yeah, it's it's an amazing piece of music, and I, I definitely encourage um, all of our listeners to check it out. It's uh, it's it's by the way, it's a well, it's it it isn't it isn't a single track. It's it's broken up into tracks, but you can listen to it uh, continuously, and it it feels sort of like a single piece in a way. It's it's about forty five minutes long. Um, we'll we'll definitely play a little bit of it um, on the air for our listeners. Uh, but I, I, yeah, I just want to share how excited I am for this to come out because it, it really is a lovely piece. Thank you. Uh, it is actually one 45 minute piece. The division into six tracks, frankly, was just at the request of the record label who said, we've got to put some of the stuff online and to promote music online, it's really inconvenient to have a, a 45 minute piece. So can you chop it up somehow? And that actually proved to be a very difficult task. And because it's a piece that really runs straight through, when you listen to single tracks, you'll hear that either the beginning or the end of some tracks, or in some cases, both are pretty abrupt. And that's because there simply were no places in the piece to begin and end tracks, really, except for very few. So um, it, it appears as six tracks, but also on in the booklet, you'll see the request to please listen to it in one sitting of 45 minutes. So definitely uh, feel free to excerpt for the purpose of radio play in any way that you wish. It also doesn't have to be in conformity with these tracks. You can fade in and out or, or whatever. But really the ideal way to hear this uh, record is to do it in one sitting of 45 minutes. And I think those 45 minutes will go by pretty quickly because it's quite varied music. Yeah, they did for me. I mean, my, my first listen, I was... Uh... I, I I only listened to this rather than w something I sometimes do. Maybe uh, I can shamefully admit that I'm listening to music while doing some other activity. But um, this makes for a very rewarding listen. Yeah. So so I uh, once again recommend our listeners to check it out. Um, something I was going to ask you about, probably not until later in the interview, but it it just came up sort of a second ago. Your work on the marimba lumina. Um, so this is an instrument I think made by the Bukla company. Is that right? Designed by uh, Donald Bukla, who was along with Robert Moog, one of the, basically the two most seminal synthesizer engineers during the early days of, of synthesizers. And unfortunately he's no longer around. He died a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, he made a lot of uh, um, modular synthesizers that are still fairly popular today. Then in his later years, he started uh, designing MIDI controllers. So basically instru electronic instruments that are meant to control other electronic instruments. And this marimba lumina is one of these MIDI controllers he designed. It was supposed to sort of imitate a marimba, but it actually to me doesn't really do such a great job of imitating the marimba. It does a fantastic job of being a completely novel and original instrument in its own right. And uh, I'm a drummer and I really like electronics and I started getting into playing electronic percussion. And I was looking for an instrument to play that can sort of do things that I envision with electronic percussion. And I happened to know Don and then I happened to go to his house one day and try out this instrument. And I fell in love with it, and I've been playing it since 2005. I, I highly encourage also anyone who's listening to this interview um, to check out Lucas Ligeti's uh, Marimba Lumina playing. I, I know there are some at least unofficial um, examples on YouTube, because to me, it's like I can hear a recording of something you've done with this, uh, with this interface or instrument, uh, as, as we might call it. But I, it, it, it's not always clear, you know, you, you may do one thing where you, you trigger a long sequence with a single touch, and then during other passages, you'll be extremely involved, kind of doing uh, polyrhythmic playing. It's, it's very interesting, your use of that instrument. Well, I mean, let me say that this sort of, uh, this joint issue, the issue of the, this junk to, uh, relationship between what you see a person play and what comes out orally uh, is 
I think inherent in almost all electronic music and it's it's a, a problem that's disturbed me quite a lot over the years so I'll say something about that in a second but I just wanted to say that I do have a, an album out it's called African Machinery African written with a K uh, on the Tzadik label it came out all the way back in 2008 uh, which is, consists almost entirely of solo music of mine for the Marimba Lumina that I play so that's that's official, that's out there, and it's a lot better probably than most YouTube videos. Uh, recently, I haven't worked so much with the Marimba Lumina, uh, but I'm sort of uh, preparing to get back into it more. Uh, in uh, this piece that is now out on CD, the uh, that which has remained, that which will emerge, I play the Marimba Lumina, but my uh, playing is barely audible to uh, the audience or to the listener of the CD because it fulfills more of an internal conducting function for the ensemble. So I trigger some samples, but my, um, my audible contribution is limited, but my, um, let's say, deeper contribution to the music of the ensemble is definitely intact. And the Marimba Lumina is a pretty neat instrument for doing that kind of a thing. Um, but, you know, I've always been disturbed by the fact, especially with laptop performance, that I see a person sitting behind a computer, they might be checking their email or something, I don't know. And at the same time, they're playing music and I, I don't hear any connection, uh, or I don't see any connection rather with what I hear. And uh, so I think that on the Marimba Lumina, that is mitigated somewhat by seeing me hit this instrument. Uh, percussion is always an instrument where the uh, optical impression and the oral impression can be linked up probably better than on most other instruments. And uh, I think this is also true here. And I've tried to, to, to design my music in such a way that one can more or less follow what I do. But you are right that sometimes I'll trigger longer things and then it becomes a little bit opaque as far as that's concerned. But I would say that generally I play the music that I play on the, on the Marimba Lumina. I don't just you know, set things in motion and let them execute on their own. Uh, I, I, I really, I love electronic music, but I really also love to play music. And I never understood why playing electronics would necessitate me being sort of hands off about the music that comes out. So there's no, there's, there's very little or no randomness and, and actually very little algorithmic composition going on there. It's really played music, but I think still, the electronics just it, it allows me to influence the music in different ways from what I would do as a you know conventional instrumental performer. That's all. Those are all amazing observations, and I I am sort of especially struck um, by the one about the marimba lumina actually as a as a tool of conducting, uh, not just as as an instrument to be heard. Uh, yeah, that's a pretty amazing insight. I mean, any, I think any a MIDI controller that, con, you know, controls the signal that other people are hearing through some other instrument can be used that way. Uh, the Marimba Lumina happens to be a particularly sophisticated MIDI controller with a lot of different possibilities. So just to tell you one, I have four mallets uh, that uh, have four different colors and I can program the instrument, the instrument will recognize which color mallet is hitting it. And so I can uh, program it completely differently depending on which color mallet I use. So it's almost like using like, four instruments at the same time. It's pretty unbelievable. That's just one of many things. Right, wow, wow. It's based um, on magnetic fields. So I don't actually need to what, touch sorry? it on magnetic fields. So the, the, you know, where a normal marimba would have uh, keys or, 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 or bars or slats or whatever you want to call them of wood this has coils hidden under a, a thin sheet of plastic they're coils and the, the the mallets are like antennas so it doesn't work with normal mallets i, I have these special mallets that are like antennas and uh, then as soon as i'm close enough to the instrument the instrument will react so i don't actually need to hit it in reality it's amazing it's amazing I, I, I don't want to spend the whole interview talking about this one instrument, but what was the learning curve like? I mean, because obviously if it, if it responds somewhat differently than an acoustic instrument. 
I mean, I, I sort of had to figure out a new technique for it, but you know, I'm not a trained mallet player, so I'm a, I'm a trained drummer and I'm not a trained mallet player. So I di didn't really know how to play with four mallets and other things that trained mallet players do. Uh, so I kind of figured out, I kind of developed my own technique. It came through the process of experimenting and playing. And I find this very interesting. I really find interesting what happens to instrumental technique, maybe acquired on conventional orchestral instruments or the like, when you switch over to electronics or when you add electronics and what kind of special techniques can be developed to work with the affordances of electronic instruments. So for me, those are really interesting research questions that I try to um, get to the bottom of as I work with electronics. And I think that puts me in a little bit of an outsider's position among people who play live electronic music, because mostly most people who do that are very much focused on sound processing and not really focused on questions of, for example, movement and motion and how that, uh, you know, the emotional interaction with the instrument and how motion and sound relate to each other. That's kind of one of my main areas of interest and it's not something that I see research very much. It's a fascinating question. I, I, yeah, I'd be curious to see. Uh, are there other people you feel like are, are really sort of on the, either as probably as players, but, but as players or in any other capacity who are kind of on the cutting edge of this kind of research? I don't really know, honestly. Um, I, maybe more in the area of choreography. I huh. developed with some, um, you know, research assistants at, at UC Irvine, I developed a new way of playing together with MIDI controllers in an ensemble. It's called improvisation through cross adaptive data processing. And um, there we sort of in a network ensemble, we uh, kind of act upon each other's possibilities and playing. And that there is a group of researchers in Norway, uh, led by a, a musician called Eivin Brandsegg, uh, who are doing a similar thing in the audio realm. And I kind of ported that over to the MIDI realm, where we're working only with digital um, data, really, uh, already, you know, through our playing action, and uh, which makes possible a wider range of you know, post-production and editing and different types of analysis of our thought processes and things like that. But um, when it comes to, the, so that's another track I've, I've kind of started to work in, but when it comes to the motion, emotional aspect specifically with MIDI instruments, I'm, I'm not really aware of much. Of course, there are people who are developing motion sensors for performance and things like that. So uh, that is an attempt to use some extant instrumental techniques and translate those to MIDI. But I don't know of any systematic research at this yeah. time. Yeah, it's very I'd be happy to find out about that. Sure, yeah. Uh, maybe if, if you find anything good, I can play it on a future episode of the show if it's, um, if it's friendly to the audio only format. You know, this is just a, a question that I'm asking you because I, I enjoy hearing musicians answer it when I watch interviews. Um, can you, well, what are the earliest musical memories or experiences uh, that you can remember? Oh, wow. Um, when I was a little kid, um, I used to listen to a lot of music. Uh, mostly on on records we had a record player um and my mother used to play a lot of records um, with my father too i listened to records um sometimes he would also play the piano you know he was in another he had his workspace in another apartment in the same building we lived in downtown vienna in a building with fairly small apartments so he had another apartment for his workspace um, but I was listening to mostly 
you know, things from the European art music canon, such as composers like Bach and Mahler, Mozart, um, that kind of thing. But I, I really, for some reason, my most vivid memories are maybe of Bach and Mahler. And then uh, also the Beatles and things like that, a lot of different stuff. And so that was when I was like zero to, you know, three or four. And I think then I listened to a lot less. So my earliest re uh, recollections are from that kind of a thing. And I know that I, when I was like two years old or something, I used to run around in circles in the living room and sing and say, I'm a wrecker. <laughs> that's awesome wow <laughs> kids man wow <laughs> amazing amazing so <laughs> <laughs> that might have been your earliest musical experience then <laughs> yeah and i can i can sort of kind of remember that i love the thing <laughs> that's awesome but then um, you know it's strange because I didn't actually systematically learn music until after I was done with high school. So um, I didn't have this kind of, you know, I had a couple of piano lessons when I was nine, but I, I didn't have this kind of systematic musical upbringing that you would expect from someone whose father is a musician. Right, sure. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting to hear sort of just, I mean, whether people, you know, whether a musician has technically grown up in a quote unquote musician household or not, uh, just what these first exposures are. I think it's right. it's always not necessarily telling of anything, but I, it, I just uh, feel curious about it somehow. Another question that sort of maybe relates to the environment you grew up in, but, but I think relates also uh, a lot to your work and in, in ways that we'll get to soon. Um, how many languages would you uh, say that you speak and what role has multilingualism played uh, both in your life and in your work as, as a composer and a musician? Well, if I'm going to be completely honest, it's an embarrassing answer. I really only speak three languages, English and German and French. Those three I speak fluently. I speak English and German natively. I mean, English is not my native language, but I think you know, unless you disagree, I think I speak it on a speak and write English on a native level. I don't think one can really discern any difference between my English and that of a, of somebody who's spoken it from birth. Um, it's strange because my actual mother tongue is Hungarian, and my mother did speak Hungarian to me when I was a very little child. But for many reasons, that stopped very soon thereafter. Uh, there were too many people around who didn't speak Hungarian. And I guess she was also happy not to be in Hungary, you know, after having survived the Holocaust and Stalinism there. I mean, I grew up in Austria, so definitely the Holocaust would have been an issue there too. Stalinism right. not. Uh, and uh, I was born in Austria and, and my parents really wanted to raise me as a child who was adapted to the living circumstances in Austria. So I was raised with German as my first language. And then English came very soon in kindergarten. And today I don't feel a difference between those two languages. French came later, but through my uh, work in Africa, spending very much time in Francophone Africa, particularly Cote d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso, I've, um, uh, I've come to speak French completely fluently. Um, and I'm embarrassed that I never really learned to speak Hungarian. So I, I understand a fair amount. And then of course, through speaking uh, French, other Latin based languages, such as Italian, Spanish, Portuguese are fairly easy for me to understand. Uh, so I can read to a fair degree in those languages, but I, I don't really speak them. And one thing that I really wanna, wanna do now that I'm, you know, starting to get a little older, <laughs> uh, I, which is a weird time maybe to do this, but I would like to learn more languages. In 2019, which seems like it was, you know, just a year and a half ago, but it seems like an eternity because of everything that's happened in between. Uh, I spent two months in Portugal and that was a wonderful experience. 
And it's such a beautiful language. I would love to learn Portuguese. I would love to learn Hungarian, which I've never really gotten a chance to learn to speak properly. Being that I spend so much time in Africa, I would love to learn um, one or the other African language, Jula or Isizulu or, you know, I don't know. I don't know when I'll be able to actually uh, tackle that, but it's definitely something I want to do. Uh, but really fluently, I, I only speak three. And the other, well, my, 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 my level in the others is very poor. Yeah, of course. And I mean, I, I think it, um, it speaks to your actual fluency that you even make that distinction rather than being one of these people who will come out and say, oh, well, I speak, you know, seven languages or I speak 10 languages, oh, you know. Um, no, no, but I, I know that uh, you've been exposed to a lot of these things. And I, I know that you're, you're also um, rather humble when it comes to, you know, speaking about yourself and your own abilities. So I know, yeah, on top of those three that you speak fluently, I mean, it's, I think it's a great goal too to, to want to um, expand the number of languages that one speaks. And I, I know it's easiest for children, but I don't think it's ever too late. You know, I think I think it's nice and, re and very convenient to speak multiple languages, but I also am not convinced that it, unless maybe these languages are from completely diff different parts of the world, let's say, for example, in Chinese, uh, the, the, the idea of tones and the very different relationship between sound and uh, sounding and written language and the very different connection between meaning and writing, uh, that does, I think, lead to a different way of thinking. But I don't think that different types of grammatical construction systems necessarily lead to radically different ways of thinking about life. I would be rather in agreement with John McWhorter on, on this issue, saying that that is, I would say, somewhat limited in its impact, that languages can be very differently constructed but some of the underlying thought processes as a speaker would still be similar because simply these, these grammatical processes, when you're fluent in a language, they become automatized. You're not really thinking, for example, if I say something in German versus English that needs a different grammatical construct, because of course, German grammar is a lot more complex. You have cases and all that. But it's not like I'm actively thinking about that. Yeah, there was this, um... It, we're getting off topic here, but I'll just say it quickly since we're since we're already here. Um, I was watching a, a lecture recently um, by the philosopher Suleiman Bashir Gianni, and he mentioned a book I think by Alexis Kagame that was basically arguing I don't know the exact opposite because I haven't read the book I I can't uh, speak to the argument so much, but it, it was this very interesting idea that um, you know basically some some very fundamental, um, I think, Aristotelian categories that had been posited as sort of universals. Uh, he was arguing that, that if you had done the same sort of analysis in certain East African languages, you might actually come out with a different number of sort of fundamental categories of, of uh, how reality is constituted or, or something along those lines. Well, I think it's I think it's possible to some degree, and of course, different languages have very different ways of describing reality. And uh, for example, when I think about now that you say East Africa, you know, uh, for example, a form of East African music that I'm relatively knowledgeable about, such as uh, the traditional court music of the Kingdom of Buganda and Uganda. If you look at the terminology in Luganda, which I don't speak, but I, I do know this, that this terminology that is used to, for example, describe different ways of playing, let's say the Amadinda xylophone, uh, it's very proverbial. And so it's a different approach. But again, I think that somehow the automation in using the language, I think makes one also brush past these things. I think that one thing that we're seeing at the moment in a lot of um, philosophy, in a lot of the humanities, is that there is a fashion to overemphasize differences between cultures. And that I think 
uh, comes from a certain political worldviews. And for me, you know, I do a lot of intercultural work and also, for example, in this project I did in Poland, it's, to me, it's really important to emphasize our shared humanity and our shared society that I think we have and we need to have and we need to promote. Uh, that is not to say that there aren't differences between cultures, but to posit, for example, that these uh, cultures are different because of some kind of inherent differences between uh, you know, races and, and things like that. I think it has very little scientific foundation. And I think it is a convenient tool to play cultures out against each other, which I think is very much on the agenda of certain people these days. Um, I, I, I really regard the, you know, what often calls itself the social justice movement as a main culprit in this area. I think instead of creating social justice, it's driving people apart. And it's driving people apart because it, it's constantly maintaining that there is some kind of difference between people of different groups. And to me, the question, first of all, whether it even makes sense to um, divide people into groups according to race or ethnicity and, and other such factors, I think, is, is, I think it's a really important question because what that kind of a worldview ultimately does is it robs all of us of our individuality. And there's actually, since we're both in Southern California, there's a sociologist at UCLA, Rogers Brubaker. He has a book called Ethnicity Without Groups. And I think that's a very interesting concept that it is actually possible to speak, for example, of ethnicity without dividing people into groups. So it's a collection of essays that tackles this idea from, from different uh, uh, angles. But um, I think that oftentimes these kinds of cultural differences are posited. And then when you actually take a deeper look, you see that in practice, that often doesn't really play out. And that as humans, our concerns, both culturally and just in life in general, are 98%, let's say, shared. And that I think it's really dangerous to distract the attention from what we share and overemphasize the things that, that divide us. Because it then creates divisions, it, create, it, it causes people to retrench and go back into their sort of um, you know, group identity. The identity politics makes people to assign, and worse yet, intersectionally assign and then we, we balkanize society into these very, very small segments. And suddenly we don't share anything and we compete. And uh, I think that's actually a very negative thing. So I find this a very, very disturbing trend. Yeah, and I, I think this is uh, actually like the, the perfect place to segue um, to, to a, a closely related uh, set of topics. Um, which is basically the, you know, the subject of your dissertation, um, an idea that you call experimental intercultural collaboration. Um, there's one line that I sort of, well, there are several lines, you know, that stuck out to me when I was going over your dissertation. Um, the one I want to ask you about now was actually a quote from three authors, um, Robert Mawana Kwame, Eric Ayesia Crofi and Sean Adams, the line is that a concept of musical cultures as solitary islands may be something that does not truly represent the reality of life in a modern and complex world. What is that concept? What, what relevance does it have to your work and your concept of experimental intercultural collaboration? I think it has extreme relevance in that no culture is pure and uh, I think cultures come in, in, in good part from ideas that people have, and these ideas somehow then get taken up. Now, some ideas, it's a little bit of a, almost like an evolutionary uh, process where some ideas get taken on by others, get developed and enter the cultural canon, others fall uh, by the wayside. I wouldn't necessarily see that in a Darwinian way. You know, it's not necessarily that those ideas that fall by the wayside are necessarily weaker ideas or less worthy or less able to be developed. 
in, in oftentimes this kind of selection happens due to also social pressures of various types and so on and so forth. But I think that uh, there is no such thing as a pure culture. And therefore, I also believe, you know, I try not to be to, to, to do cultural appropriation in my intercultural work. I try to avoid that. And I think I've developed fairly uh, effective mechanisms to avoid cultural appropriation. But I also think that we need to ask ourselves the fundamental question of what cultural appropriation really is and how significant of an issue it is, because actually all cultures appropriate from each other constantly in some way and enrich themselves through each other. And there is no culture in the world that hasn't done that. And that's true. You know, it's, it, it, I think that's really a, a universal truth. And th there is no culture that has, that, because people come into contact. And of course, today, people come into contact with each other way more than they used to before. But let's not underestimate what, what kinds of contacts you have from long ago. Because, for example, look at, for example, the culture of Madagascar. Here you have an Austronesian language. So the people of Madagascar was probably not populated before some people came from around the, the area of what is today Indonesia, which is a pretty far trip by boat. I mean, how they managed to do that is, is really a, a, an interesting question. The much closer Africa apparently had not populated Madagascar, but nowadays Malagasy culture is really a syncretic mixture of, it's a very, very special and unique thing but there are elements of, uh, of Indonesian and elements of African culture there. And um, so, you know, this is a synthesis that happened a very, very long time ago. So it's not just since airplanes or the internet or since, you know, European explorers or colonization or something like that, that, that this happened. Oftentimes when, when talking about, for example, culture in Africa, there's this idea, oh, well, you know, that's a European influence. But let's not forget that, for example, uh, Arabs came uh, to Africa a long time before European explorers came. So this idea to, to assign all you know, power of appropriation to the West is, I think, a, a, a real historically revisionist idea that is in a very trivial way uh, often said without a real reflection of, uh, about its accuracy. Uh, African music, for example, is so incredibly influential. We often take it for granted, but I mean, if we really think about the structures that underlie most popular music worldwide these days, those structures come from Africa. And so uh, it is actually, uh, you know, Africa is all often painted as a victim and often that is uh, of colonization, of exploitation, and often that is, that is correct. Uh, it is in many ways a victim, uh, and it is, is in very much an under uh, recognized and under considered part of the world, which I think is extremely important. That's one of the reasons why I uh, engage so much with it. But uh, I also think that in this, in assigning victim in this this victim status, for example, to Africa. A lot of people do that because they think that by doing that, they help or they, they, they somehow promote or raise the status of Africa. But actually what they're truly doing by it is that they are just entrenching their own power by being able to assign this victim status. So it's again, a very counterproductive thing. I think in, in, instead of seeing Africa as a victim, I try to see it as an equal and engage with it at, on, on equal terms. And that's a, a big part of my idea of experimental intercultural collaboration. So um, that also means that we should recognize and be aware of the immense influence that African culture has had on the rest of the world. And we should learn from each other and take on things from each other. That doesn't mean that I become African. I've spent a lot of time in Africa, I haven't become African. Uh, I've become acculturated in Africa, but I don't care really whether I'm African or not. So that for that reason, I'm not saying that I've become African, but I've 
I've become used to many things. Uh, I operate well in the daily life there, but mostly I've learned a lot from it. And I've tried for that to be, uh, you know, a bi-directional thing so that my African collaborators also learn a lot from me. And um, in the case, for example, of my project in Poland, to get back to that for a second, I learned such a huge amount about Jewish culture and history that I, being, you know, officially, you know, of Jewish ancestry, but I didn't know because I hadn't grown up with that kind of uh, cultural associations. And there I learned about that. And it was very interesting, you know, for me as a somebody who does not support identity politics, for example, I did not care whether the musicians I worked with were Jewish or not. I didn't even discuss this with them. Because for me, it's it's a non-issue. For me, the issue is, do you have anything relevant to say about this topic? Mm -hmm. And that can be said from a lot of perspectives. It can be said from growing up in a heavily Jewish uh, cultural or religious uh, environment, or from not at all doing that, or from all points in between. So I think that if as soon as we think about something, we you know we'll have, and engage with it in a in a deep way and ask questions. We'll have some thoughts about it. I, I want to ask you more about um, this concept and practice of experimental intercultural collaboration. Um, but before I do, I, for the sake of the listeners who may not be completely familiar with your work, um, could you maybe describe this concept through telling about one of these types of collaborations uh, that you've been involved with? Maybe one uh in which the other collaborators have been from the african continent so we can also get a feeling for what we might call your african connection at the same time yeah sure so maybe the easiest one to talk about is the very first one i did so i started getting interested in african music through a lecture there were a couple of kind of uh simultaneous uh developments that exposed me to african music when i was in my early 20s but maybe the most significant one was a lecture by an Austrian ethnomusicologist, Gerhard Kubik, who gave a talk at the University of Vienna that I happened to hear. I studied in Vienna and I, I happened to, to attend that lecture. And it was about this aforementioned Amadinda xylophone music from, uh, from Uganda. And it completely changed my way of thinking about music. So what I actually wanted to still say about the, the point before about languages not necessarily leading to different ways of thinking in the speakers. I would not necessarily say the same thing about music, because I do think that different ways, different systems of music making uh, lead you to different thought processes. And that's also, you know, something that I work on a lot in my works for like improvising ensembles. I'm always after finding different thought processes during the process of improvisation and how that can lead to different uh, audible results. So um, obviously the thought processes that go into both composing and playing this Amadinda xylophone music were completely different from anything that I'd ever known. And I was very intrigued. And the first question that I asked myself being, you know, somebody who, whose objective is to be a creative musician, not really. My objective isn't to be an ethnomusicologist. Um, I'm interested in ethnomusicology, but I'm a creative musician. So my question that I asked myself was, what independent creative responses can I come up with to this? And that was a very deliberate question that I asked myself. And then I started coming up with things. I started thinking about it and coming up with things. And then somebody heard these things that I started coming up with and recommended me to the Goethe Institute, the German cultural institutes abroad. I'm not German, but somehow I, I was recommended to the Goethe Institute. And then the Goethe Institute, some years later, contacted me and invited me to go to Cote d'Ivoire, to the Ivory Coast, to work with, quote unquote, traditional musicians there. And it was like a two week workshop. And so I arrived there in the Ivory Coast and I found that there were musicians who too many musicians who were interested in in collaborating so that was a good thing but there were too many so i i played them some of my weirdest music just to introduce myself and the next day there were only 15 people that came and these people have remained friends for life and i you know just today i was in touch with one of them 
uh, barely a, a couple of days ever go by without me being in touch with at least one of them. And uh, even though some of them I haven't seen in now more than 20 years, but that workshop then turned into a group that recorded a CD and that toured for the next five years intermittently and so on and so forth. And then indirectly, it led to another project called Burkina Electric that is still ongoing now based in Burkina Faso. But that initial group was called Beta Folie. And Beta Folie means in the Malinke language, uh, the music of us all. And the process of working was very interesting because these musicians that came to the Goethe Institute for this workshop were Abidjan at the time, the main city in the Ivory Coast, and still is today uh, a very cosmopolitan city where you find people from all over West Africa and further away. So these musicians came from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, from uh, Guinea Conakry, Guinea Bissau, Mali, Burkina Faso, Senegal, you know, kind of all over the place in Francophone West Africa, including also Lusophone in the case of uh, Guinea Bissau. So then, um, they didn't necessarily know each other. So the first step was that they actually had to figure out ways to work together. And that was an internal African intercultural collaboration that I kind of sat there and observed. And then I started observing things. So for example, there were two balaphone players. So balaphone is a, is a xylophone in the, you know, in the Monde languages who are basically concentrated in that part of Africa. Uh, two balaphone players playing their balaphones. And I noticed that they would never play together. Always one would play and the other would sit out. So I asked them, hey, why aren't you two playing together? And they said, we can't play together because our instruments are tuned differently. It's not compatible. So then I said to them, okay, I understand. But what if you tried to play together and made a thing out of the instruments being in different tuning? Like what kind of creative uh, ideas can we come up with by combining these incompatibly tuned instruments, maybe we can find a new way in which they're compatible. So then they tried to do that and it actually worked. And we came up with, you know, with some pieces that incorporated those aspects. So I think that's the experimental aspect. I think the intercultural, that we try to do things deliberately that we don't know, that are new to all of us, the intercultural aspect is that people from different cultural backgrounds come together to work. And what does that mean, a different cultural background? Well, that can be a lot of things. Uh, I mean, it could be a musician from Europe and a musician from Africa who've learned music in different ways and think about music in different ways and use music for different purposes and use different instruments to make the music and so on and so forth. But, you know, it could also be a much closer thing. You have two musicians from, you know, L.A. could uh, grow up on the same street, have very similar ethnic background or something like that. And yet one of them ends up as, I don't know, an oboist in the L.A. Philharmonic, and the other one ends up as, uh, I don't know, guitarist in Metallica or something like that. that those are two very different cultures of making music. Uh, yet the people grew up within, uh, you know, shouting distance of each other in a suburb of LA or something like that. I mean, I'm just making up a situation now, but, but this happens. And when these two people come together and make music, that could also be considered an intercultural collaboration, it, you know, according to my way of seeing it. So I guess it's different knowledge bases, different things that different knowledge that we bring in different skills, different thought approaches, different things that we care about in the music. And we kind of enter into a dialogue and try to analyze our viewpoints for each other and ask each other questions and engage in what is hopefully a long term dialogue that is both theoretical and practical and collaborate as equals. So there's not necessarily, you know, when I came to Africa, I said, well, I can't impose my music on those people. They won't know what to do with it, probably. I, uh, even though we share a lot, there is also, there are also differences. So that means that in two weeks, it's going to be difficult for, for them to learn music that I try to impose on them. Same exact thing reciprocally that uh, 
I won't be able to adapt that quickly to their music. So let's rather try something that's new for all of us. And that brings together and where we can celebrate our shared humanity through inventing our own language that is that is unique to our collaboration. You talk about, um, or I, I don't know if I should say you talk about, but I've, I've at some time or another, I've, I've heard you talk about um, the, the fact that these collaborations seem to deepen over time. Can you talk about that at all? Yes, the collaborations definitely deepen over time because the better you know each other and the more you know about each other, you know, the, the, the more you're probably going to be able to do together. I mean, for me, it's really important to say that I don't consider in an intercultural collaboration the people I'm, I'm working with as representatives of any particular culture. Uh, I really consider them as individuals and each individual can bring their own knowledge and their own uh, ideas to the table. I mean, I really think it's a mistake. You know, sometimes we look at, let's say, a group of, of musicians playing some like folk musicians from some tradition, playing some traditional music, let's say. Maybe they're playing at a ritual in a village or something like that. And we tend to just, again, assign this group identity to them. And we forget that each one of these musicians has their own individual mind and own individual thoughts. And probably these thoughts about the music tradition and the ritual are different for each one. You know, for one person, let's say the, I don't know, like mystical elements of this could be extremely important. And for the other, it could be completely unimportant. So, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So I think I, I, I'm always very cautious about making assumptions about people without knowing more about them. So I try to go in and presume that we're just people that are just entering into a conversation. So I kind of assume initially that we're the same, just because I think it is more productive to assume that than assuming differences. And, and then as we talk to each other, differences emerge, and then we can discuss these differences in a productive way. I think that if I came and posited differences, there would be a sort of adversarial or power-based encounter. And that is something that I want to avoid. So then, um, of course, the longer this conversation continues, I mean, with my friends in Burkina Electric, we've been working together in that group for now 16 or 17 years almost. So they're like family. You know, we've shared so much. We've, we've spent so much time on the road. Also, a lot of time touring in the U.S., uh, you know, long highway rides, um, uh, you know, concerts, after concert dinners, you know, sharing rooms in hotels and sometimes roughing it up together. You know, we, we, uh, we've become family. And uh, so at that point, we know each other, the way we know each other as individuals, again, takes over and becomes much more important. Than the cultural background and i think uh it's very difficult to parse apart culture and individuality and i think maybe it's unnecessary to do that so experimental intercultural collaboration is also experimental interpersonal collaboration at the same time mm. there's one um there's one line i read that really kind of summed up for me really nicely um a lot of a lot of your descriptions of experimental intercultural collaboration uh, in your dissertation, you said the difficulty of trying to create innovative work forces participants to ask questions and discuss concepts rather than merely trusting intuition to locate a lowest common denominator platform for interaction. Yeah, you know it's really easy to find that lowest common denominator. So a lot of intercultural projects kind of just end up with people jamming and the jam often then becomes this sort of like roughly jazz fusion-y thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I tend to uh, differentiate between uh, improvisation and jamming. So to me, jamming is an improvisation where a few basic um, attributes or systemic uh, 
um, aspects of the music are agreed upon. So for example, let's play in, I don't know, in E major or something, or let's play this groove. Whereas to me, improvising, and that's just a personal definition, I think, but improvising refers to just playing without, uh, uh, you know, discussing this kind of thing and, and have a purely musical, a, a, a communication in purely musical terms. And I, I have to say, you know, uh, as a kind of a cautionary remark, I don't consider music a universal language because I, I don't even know if I consider music a language. So if it's not even a language, then it can barely be a universal language. But I also think that you know the differences are significant. I just think that we also share a lot, which allows us now to effectively communicate in this global lowest common denominator language. Or you know you have I don't know people who take a recording of traditional music and then put a a a, a beat, make a beat. Yeah. On oh it. man. And that's like international <laughs> style. You know, it's international style, like. Rock rhythm is, has become like international style funk rhythm. Something it works for everything. You 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 can force everything into that straitjacket. And you know, on the one hand, I'm extremely happy to see so many young musicians, for example, in a in a region like let's say Africa, uh, become really entrepreneurial about their music and do, for example, hip hop. Hip hop is really has sort of really changed the landscape of music in Africa because uh, it's 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 made young musicians be so much more resourceful in also organizing how to disseminate and celebrate their own music. Completely new systems have emerged, festivals and, and things like that. This is all true and it's all cool. At the same time, I also worry about what this is going to do to the you know, very particular and interesting and varied regional approaches to music making traditions that have, say, their own rhythms, which are now all kind of being replaced by the hip hop beats, so to, so to say. And, and the reggaeton dance hall kind of that, beat too, right? Yeah, totally. So, you know, all of these things. So, but at the same time, I also see, you know, for example, African rhythms making inroads into indie rock in, in Brooklyn and things like that. So it's a, again a more complex thing, but I think, uh, you know, I'm, I don't. Most ethnomusicologists are really concerned about uh, preservation, it, it, it's understandable because they study these cultures and they love these cultures. But I've come to think, and this is something that I've also started to write about and talk about at ethnomusicological conferences and music education conferences and the like. I really think that the most important thing that we can try to preserve from a, a music tradition is the way of thinking. Ultimately, exactly what instrument it's being played on, or even what it sounds like, isn't as important as how it's thought. And uh, I think that once we challenge each other to understand some things about how we think structurally about music, we're then able to more easily transcend these um, you know, lowest common denominator scenarios and go into a more thorough and more deep um, relationship where we combine our knowledge, you know, be this indigenous or non, you know, we all have indigenous knowledge, but uh, for some of it, it's one thing, for another, it's another thing. Uh, we're all indigenous, we're all ethnic, we all have, you know, we all have these things, even if we're from the West, you know, the indigenous knowledge might be you know, I heard Bach and Mahler when I was a zero-year-old child. That's not any less indigenous knowledge than, you know, a, a, a ritual somewhere in Africa. And not anymore. But it's always just different. It's very interesting. Um, I, I want to ask you more about your dissertation. I'm, I'm going to limit it to one more question so I can move back and ask you uh, some other stuff. Um, but you had a really interesting um, passage in there uh, where I, where you were basically talking about early sort of the earliest examples of what could be uh, at least sort of within the Western canon um, could be considered not really examples of experimental intercultural collaboration, but at least of intercultural borrowing uh, of musical forms and 
if I if I didn't misread it, you sort of I think made an argument that you know in in the days of colonialism and before um, because of basically the the predatory uh, nature of what we could call intercultural contact, there wasn't really. I mean, you know, it, it wasn't really, uh, there wasn't space for these kinds of collaborations to emerge. But there's a quote that you have, uh, you know, now fast forwarding to today, there's a quote that you have, um, this is now your own words that I'm reading to you. You said 25 years on from my initial involvement in what I later came to call experimental intercultural collaboration, I feel as if I've just scratched the surface of what might be possible. Looking at you know, our present moment as one in which this kind of collaboration is possible and maybe moving towards a future of, if not increased possibility, at least the same uh, kind of amount of possibility. Could you, I mean, totally speculatively, we won't hold you to this, but could you, could you guess as to what these kinds of collaborations might look like or might yield in the future? It's a very difficult question. Um, one of my favorite personal sayings is that I think that 99% of the expressive possibilities through music that we as humans uh, have somehow at our disposal have not yet been discovered. And if, if we say that it's all been done, then we only have our own lack of imagination to blame for that. Um, but of course, my imagination also is limited. So I don't know the answer. And I certainly don't know the answer uh, for what other people are doing. I can tell you that one of the things I'd like to do next with my group, Burkina Electric, with that group, we uh, have uh, collaborated with Carol Armitage and her basically modern ballet company. We then did a collaboration with the uh, Mitteldeutsche uh, radio symphony orchestra in Leipzig in Germany, where we, um, where I composed a suite for uh, the band, so a West African electronic pop band with a, a symphony orchestra. Uh, we were then supposed to do an expansion of this project with the Brussels uh, Philharmonic in Belgium uh, in November 2020, which of course due to COVID uh, got postponed so it's now supposed to take place in november 2021 and i'm hoping that will happen now as planned uh, and having done those kinds of let's say uh, collaborations with very much let's say european based uh, paradigms of art making uh, we kind of thought that the next thing we'd like to tackle is an opera and uh we have a commission from uh, a festival in, in Essen in Germany to do with certain small things, but it's really something that we're still looking for uh, an outlet and uh, a, a commission for to be able to do this. But we were thinking that an interesting topic for this opera could be um, something that is called uh, parenté à plaisanterie, which is a sort of ritual humor a traditional ritual humor that you find in various parts of Africa. It's particularly highly developed and used in uh, Burkina Faso, but it's also very well known in Guinea and all the way to Central Africa and Congo, for example, and, and other places. So it's a general African phenomenon, a kind of ritual humor that is used when people of different backgrounds meet each other. And it sort of uh, defrays inter-ethnic tension. And it's it's become, I'm sure that's something that in your travels in Africa, you've also had a lot of contact with. And um, so it, it's, it's a very, very different way of going about uh, the, let's say, uh, the, the fight against racism and prejudice than we see in America today. And, uh, I think it's it's proven to be quite effective. I'm not saying that it's necessarily something the rest of the world should imitate, but I, I we thought it would be an interesting topic because it's sort of under researched, and um, I mean some sociologists have written about it, but it's it's not 
huge, the amount of research done on it. And uh, I think it's a very different paradigm of, 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 te- of, of just even managing uh, situations where there could be such tensions. And I think at the very least, it's important to uh, influence, to, to, sorry, to, to inform, to inform people in other parts of the world about this, that this is actually possible and that in other places this is being done. And so I think that that's probably what the opera is going to be about. I think that in, in the current so politically charged and difficult time, I think we're also on the intercultural level found finding it difficult to completely uh, sidestep the area of social commentary and uh, um, you know somehow engagement with this, these all these political and other problems that we're facing, um, and so that's that's something that is definitely on the agenda for us if possible. Uh, I really think that there's a lot more that could be done with technology in intercultural collaboration, and that even should, under all uh, normal circumstances, include being able to collaborate over longer distances uh, through telematics and things like that. But unfortunately, the technology hasn't really evolved to the point where we can do that over such large distances. So, for example, two people in California can play together in an ensemble with very little latency. Um, over the internet, but between here and let's say Burkina Faso, well, good luck with that, not just because of the low speeds of the connections there, but also simply because of the geographical distance. And, you know, in my in my work as a university professor, I'm, I'm also, for example, running an ensemble at the moment. And in this ensemble, I decided to completely eschew the idea of trying to play together because we're all remote uh, and just we're trying to do completely different things. We're trying to look at ensemble playing from a completely different perspective because I just thought it didn't really make sense. Yeah, I didn't know where the students would be geographically and, and, and so on and so forth. But I think that there's there, there are interesting things to do uh, there. Um, and I also really think that, uh, you know, so far, the seriously involved intercultural projects done uh, have been few. And in many cases, the agenda has been more actually peacemaking, conflict resolution, like the things that you sometimes see, for example, in, in, uh, is between Israel and Palestine, orchestras and things like that. Uh, Daniel Barenboim has a project there. And uh, or, for example, as in the case of the Silk Road project with Yo-Yo Ma, it's a much more of a community-oriented project. Whereas in my case, most of my projects have been really uh, hardcore, you know, musical innovation. And uh, I think in all of these areas, there's a lot more that can be done. But certainly in the musical innovation field, which is kind of the one that I've been dealing with most, there's so many possibilities. I just have so many ideas of just things we could try out developing, you know, incorporating more performance art aspect, for example, uh, and seeing, you know, concept art aspects, which there isn't really a concept art in the Duchampian sense or something like that in African culture. So how can these things be, be you know, integrated? Uh, how can one even find a common vocabulary to talk about these, uh, let's say, less representational ways of presenting art on stage and things like that? So many interesting questions. Um, I, I want to turn now away from, uh, well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, experimental intercultural collaborations will continue to, to figure in, in uh, whatever time we have left for this conversation. But I want to turn back to sort of uh, questions that are uh, phrased more broadly. Um, let's see. Well, one thing is that now having, having talked about, uh, in some depth, your, your African connection, um, and your, your musical, um, goings on on the continent, what are some of your biggest non-African influences and even influences in Western or European music? Yo, you know, there are so many. 
Uh, so, so, so many. Um, I think, I, I don't even know where to start. Uh, you know, composers, I mean, I mentioned Bach and Mahler. Today I was listening with my you know, one-year-old son, we were listening to Haydn together. And uh, it's such a delight to listen to this kind of music every time. And I thought again, I should just take, you know, some scores by Haydn and copy them uh, note by note to really learn how this person was composing his music. I mean, the, the, the sense of kind of expressing the absolute most with the greatest economy of musical means is really stunning in his case, for example. Um, a lot of, you know, experimental musicians uh, say that they are not so interested in European music of the kind of Baroque, classical, and Romantic periods. I definitely am. But that's not to say that I'm not very interested in early music and Renaissance music and new music. And, you know, I listen to a lot of new music. These days, it's mostly on the internet. Um, and uh, I listen to a lot of jazz and a lot of experimental improvised music. Um, I, you know, go through phases of listening to more and less music. When I'm in a really intense composition phase, I um, maybe zone out a little bit. But as I build up to that, I listen to tons of music because it's also part of the research of preparing for a composition I, to me. Um, and, and it helps me focus somehow. Uh, and it also distracts me and those distractions are good. I like being distracted. Um, you know, I've never been one for like working in a log cabin with no connection to the outside world for two months or something like that. I actually like distractions. I need breaks. And um, so, um, electronic music, also electronic dance music, um, I mean, it, it's easier to say what are not influences. So I will say that <laughs> probably even though I spent, you know, I spent a lot of years living in New York and part of those years at the end, then I, my, you know, last decade of living in New York, I lived in, uh, uh, in Bushwick in Brooklyn. But before that I lived in Hell's Kitchen, which is a part of Manhattan, very close to Times Square. And yet I think I can say, uh, very truthfully that Broadway has not been a big influence on me. <laughs> I'm shocked. Uh, you know, having I, I thought I heard its influences all throughout your catalog. So uh, I'll have to go back and take another listen with, with fresh ears. Um, I I feel like this is this is sort of the most obligatory kind of stereotypical question that that every percussionist probably gets asked during every interview. Um, but as as a percussionist, um, do you feel that you come at composition differently than people who? Well, I know that piano is technically a percussion instrument, but differently than say keyboardists or players of of other melodic instruments. You know, probably the thing with me is I had a couple of piano lessons when I was like nine, and then I stopped, and I didn't play any instrument really until I was eighteen, and then I started thinking I'd like to do something with music, and what instrument could I play? And people told me, ah, you're too old to become good at the piano or the violin. And then I thought, let me play an easy instrument that I chose percussion. It was a very stupid choice, but I somehow persevered. It's definitely not easy. Every instrument is difficult. And because there's been too many people before you who've done amazing things and they made life difficult for you by right. setting the bar high, you know? So, <laughs> so, um, so then, uh, I sort of persevered with the drums. I started with actually orchestral percussion, dropped that very quickly, wasn't mm -hmm. so interested in that and became a drummer and still am a drummer. And, you know, when people think about drums, they think first and foremost about rhythm. But truthfully, I think in many cases, playing the drums isn't really about playing more complex rhythms than other instruments. It's maybe about playing those rhythms more precisely um, but certainly it can be about combining more rhythms and I'm very interested in polyrhythms and polymeters and polytempos and, you know, some of them, some of that probably comes from being a drummer. So yeah, for sure it's different, but not having played any other, other instrument really. I mean, I play the piano, but not particularly well. It's very difficult for me to say, I wish I played a lot of other instruments, but I'm not 
actually, I don't think as much about instruments. I mean, I write very much for the instruments, for their sound. And for me, it's very important. You know, sometimes people want to commission me for to write for an instrument that I don't know so well. And then I say, well, I really have to, you know, sit down with you and, and, and get your advice on what is playable and what can be done. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I, I'm, they tell me, no, just write what you want and we'll make it work or I'll make it work. And then I say, no, I don't want that because part of me, part of my creed as a composer is that I want to actually know what I'm doing, know what I'm writing for this instrument and write something that pushes the boundaries, but is viable. And, you know, I mean, this is again, percussion, but I'm like I said before, I'm not a mallet trained mallet player. I was asked to write a marimba solo piece. And the result of this piece is a half hour long piece in five movements called thinking songs, which exists on YouTube in a fantastic uh, interpretation by Jihei Jung, who is, you know, I, I would probably think today's greatest living marimba player. And it was extremely difficult for me to figure out what could be done on the marimba. And I really tried to push the limits of the instrument. Um, and when Jihei learned a piece, she then said to me that she had to develop a new section of her brain in order to play this piece. And that to me was just the most wonderful thing that one you know, could say I was so happy because that's exactly what I what I hoped for. But um, I try not to do this through extended techniques as much as actually expanding the vocabulary, but still letting the instrument sound like what it was intended to sound for. And that doesn't come out of a conservative uh, mindset, but it comes out of a mindset of optimization. Like this instrument was optimized for this sound. And all these extended techniques, they're all well and good, but the instrument wasn't really optimized for that. So can one discover new things on this instrument and re-optimize? Sure. But one can also, for example, go into new timbral directions using electronics. And so um, I guess I always try to, to know some as much as I can about how the instrument is played but at the same time, I think more in terms of structure, I think at the end of the day, than in terms of specific instruments. And also when I improvise, it's much more important to me who I'm playing with, you know, what the personality, what the character of the person is, what their musical interests are, far more important to me than what instrument they play. On that note, I, I want to ask you what I think is going to have to be the last question. And I want to thank you so much for spending so much time with me today. Um, thank you. It's really been a pleasure. Great yeah, pleasure. it's 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 great to have you. And and I mean, you're just you're such an amazing composer, improviser, musical mind. So it's it's really a privilege for me and I'm sure for the listeners. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but uh, touching on something that you said in your last response, um, your music is extremely you know, polyrhythmic. Um, and I, I think it can often, you know, in a, in a, in a good way, and including, by the way, um, the, the marimba piece that you just mentioned, which I think you said it was called thinking pieces. Thinking songs. Yeah. Thinking songs. I'm sorry. Uh, thinking songs, which I was lucky enough to actually see performed at one of your concerts a few years ago. Um, and this is definitely, um, a feature that I that I noticed in that piece as well as in a lot of your other music um, that because you have these different rhythmic cycles and these different sort of melodic cycles going on the listener is not always uh, I mean un unless you're you know a very well-trained musician yourself the listener is not always totally clear on when the sense of resolution is going to arrive because there are sort of different lines going on simultaneously um, is that something that you strive for and think consciously about when you're composing? Does it just happen because of the way that you structurally think about music? Yeah, no, it's definitely deliberate. Uh, so like I was saying a while ago, when I first heard African music, I started to think about what could my creative responses be? And I came up with a technique. It's a kind of emotion-based technique for playing the drum set. And I quickly discovered that this technique would let me play extremely long um, uh, poly, polyrhythmic patterns, where actually they're not polyrhythmic at all, but I'm creating the illusion of, of a polyrhythm. 
And if these patterns could be hundreds and even thousands of feet long. And so I've started really getting into this idea of making these, you know, very complex superimpositions. And it got me into a way of thinking that, look, you know, I mean, for the past thousand plus years in Western music, it's been common to have more than one pitch at a time. And then between these pitches, you have consonances and dissonances, right? And why not consonances and dissonances and harmonies of rhythm and tempo? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of something that I've been working on. And I'm by far, of course, not the only composer who's dealing with simultaneous um, rhythms and, and tempi. I mean, Conlon Nancaro is just one person I'd like to mention as an influence who dealt with uh, simultaneous tempo, different tempos and things like that. Something I've also, also done a lot, both with and without uh, computer technology. So that's something I'm, I'm very interested in and I'm trying to sort of advance in my music. So it's definitely, and, and I think it, it, it gets you into also a, an, an idea of, you know, tension and resolution and things like that. So it's a way to access fairly natural or conventional ways of listening, but through completely different means. Amazing. Well, Lucas Ligeti, thank you so much for joining us on KXLU. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear how you think about the music, how you put it together. Maybe I'll, if I may, I'll say just one little, you know, shameless self-promotion plug here. Please do, uh, please uh, do. The CD, That Which Has Remained, That Which Will Emerge, uh, my project from Poland. So it's out on this record label called Colenio. It's a really great label from Austria that is not so well known in the States, but has actually really good American distribution through Nexus. So you can find the CD. It's out on uh, March 26th. So please check it out. And also, if you'd like to stay in touch, you can find me on Facebook. Well, there's, of course, my website, lucasligeti.com, but then you can also find me on Facebook and now also on Instagram and Twitter, which I've just joined oh, nice. and still don't know very much about. I have like, you know, three followers on Twitter or something at this point. <laughs> but, you, but uh, you know, we'll get you some more. Don't worry. Yeah, definitely after the get night. in touch there. And um, uh, yeah, very glad always to hear from anyone. Thank you so much, Lucas. It's an it's a absolute pleasure and privilege to have you on the show. Thank you so much.